Good afternoon and welcome to Quantify Your Applicant Pool, a free webinar brought to you by SSA TV. I'm Karen Smith and I will be moderating today's presentation. I'd like to thank Dan Harrop of Marianopolis Prep for taking the time during this busy season to share his expertise with us. Dan is an old pro of webinars, having provided one for us on the Skype interview. Be sure to check out the webinar page on admission.org to listen to that great presentation. Today, Dan will be discussing the advantages of using a rating system to help you determine your most desirable applicants. Because of the large number of participants in today's webinar, I will be muting all attendees. However, please feel free to type in any questions you may have using the box on your GoToWebinar control panel. Questions will be submitted to me, and I will present them to Dan throughout the presentation. A brief question and answer session will follow. I am recording this webinar and will make it available within a couple of days on admission.org, the SSA TV website. All registrants will receive an email with a link to the webinar page. At this time, I would like to introduce and turn the presentation over to Dan Harrop, Director of Admission at Marianopolis Preparatory School. Hi everyone, thank you Karen for this opportunity to, uh, to speak to you and to the SSA TV membership. Um, I always appreciate talking about admissions and some of the things that uh, we've developed over the years that I've experienced and refined and enhanced to help make the admissions process at Marianapolis a little bit better. And I hope that you all can use um, some bit of this to help uh, improve the culture of your own school. Um, so this particular uh, topic here, quantify your applicant pool, is really one that I think is about um, defining culture and helping you to understand what are those key attributes that um, distinguish you from your competitor. Um, and that's at one end of the continuum, at one extreme. And then at the other extreme, it will really help you to understand what kind of kids fit your school well and, and frankly, what kind of kids don't fit your, your school well. Um, and so as we walk through this, this webinar, um, I hope this will become clear. And again, I hope you'll be able to use some of these ideas to develop your own, your own rating system um, to use in your admissions process. So we'll jump right in here. Here we go, this is Prezi here, which I am, uh, I'm more of a PowerPoint person, um, someone in my office who's helped me with the Prezi, but, so who am I? Uh, my name is Dan Harrop, of course, Director of Missions, Marianapolis Prep. I'm in my 11th year in this role. Uh, when I started here in 2003, we had 211 kids. Uh, we're now up to 400. Um, you can see the breakout there of day and boarding students, but I think really what, what I am truly most proud of is the culture at Marianapolis and the community and frankly the kids that, um, the kids and faculty for that matter that, that make up our, our staff and our, and, our, and our culture. And so again, what I'm gonna show you today is a little bit of how we've um, created this culture that's so unique to Marianapolis. First, I need to thank Ray in my office, my assistant director of admissions, because he is the Prezi master and this particular platform that I will be demonstrating this uh, quantifier applicant pool um, process through is, is thanks to Ray and, and his expertise with the Prezi. So why the system? Why the system? Um, you know, for me, the system evolved many years ago. Uh, I started off at Marianapolis. It was an office of one, and I was doing everything from licking envelopes to fielding calls to doing interviews. And one of the things that I inherited at my school was this uh, an entrance exam. And it was determined um, by my predecessors that the four highest scores on an entrance exam, SSAT, um, would be scholars. They get the four scholarships. And it was, it was soon after that that I realized that that may not be actually helping us to get the best possible kids um, for Marianapolis. And so I had to figure out a way to take, um, to take these scholarship winners and create some data and decide, well, if we're going to be giving out four full scholarships, who are the best possible kids to get these scholarships? 
And again, it, it didn't take me long to realize that the entrance exam scores, the, the SSAT scores, were not the single most important variable to determine success in our, in our school. So I created this um, really simple formula that drew on all the processes of the application. And so it's everything, and, and I'll show you more as we go th through here. You'll see the whole layout and um, all the different components. But it's the application, it's the teacher recommendations, it's the essay, it's the interview, it's the parent interview. All of those different components we used to uh, essentially give the student a score. And based on those scores were the ones that essentially won the scholarships. So I think one of the things we did here is we really took this rating system to an extreme degree. And once you create your template, it's really very easy to, to, to score your files and to run with this process. Um, I'll pause for a second and see if anyone has any questions here before I really jump right in. Um, I think it's probably best if you bear with me and, and I'll, I'll be able to give you more perspective. But if anyone has any immediate questions, feel free. We don't have any at the moment, Dan. Okay, great. So you can see the scholarship winners. We have our top 10 applicants earn scholarship awards. And that's the breakout. Okay, so why, why, why the score sheets? And it was something that really the, we tried adding some objectivity to the subjective process of um, determining what, uh, who's a good candidate. And I know in my office, you know, we have a number of file readers, and some of us are great at um, speaking on behalf of students. And some of us have more time, frankly, to dig deeper into files. And some kids are very passionate, or some faculty are very passionate about some students. And there's a number of different, um, um, what's the word I'm looking for? There are a number of just different perspectives and angles that faculty have on why a student should or should not be accepted. And this really helps to level the playing field and help you to understand um, you know, what their strengths are straight up and what their weaknesses are based on the numbers. And the numbers try to level the playing field. So we use the system to help us accept the best applicant. And this system simply helps us to define the word best. It helps us under, increase our understanding of the applicant pool while minimizing the loss of quality students. And it simply turns our students into data. Okay, now there's one, um, hopefully everyone has gotten an email. Um, if you haven't, I'm going I'm to pause for a second here and just ask you to check your email. And if you print up, um, Karen sent out an email maybe 10 minutes ago that had uh, kind of the holistic grid that I'm speaking about. And I think it might be really helpful for you if you have that uh, two-page front and back or it's a two-page document. It's our, it's our score sheet that I'm going to uh, move through and really um, break it out for you. But I think if you have that, that will, that will help. Um, jumping back into the Prezi. So why not do this? I've heard some arguments saying, well, I don't have the time to do this. Uh, you know, we have an all s small office. We accept everyone. I know my school and my culture. You know, I can identify a good fit. And I think those are all, you know, reasonable, logical arguments about why not to do it. Um, I, still, I still believe and I firmly believe that once you get this template in place, you will see the infinite benefits to being able to say to your headmaster, for example, you know, based on our scoring system, these 10 kids are a risk. Based on our scoring system, these kids are, are a risk. Meanwhile, some of these 10 kids you might absolutely love. But based on your system, for some reason or another, they're a risk. And then you can go in, and when it comes down to a financial decision, do we need to take them or not, at least you can say, you know, I know these kids are a risk. Here's why they're a risk. Um, and it helps you to um, deliver your message and get everyone on your side in terms of understanding um, what you're looking at and the kids that you view as appropriate and, frankly, the kids that you view as risks. 
Oh, the McGurk effect. Um, this is a, I, I think I'm going to skip over this, but this is a, a really interesting effect. If you, if you want to take the time to Google um, the McGurk effect, it's, it's pretty interesting. But well, I'm going to skip over that for this, this webinar. So, okay, getting into the specifics of the data to be quantified. Essentially, for us, it's the typical student file. So the application, student essay, teacher recommendations, official transcript, standardized test score, application fee should not be there. We don't use that as a variable, so scratch that one. Um, what do you collect? What do you collect? You may want to use other variables. So if you're an art school, you maybe have an art portfolio. If you're a hockey school, you may have some you know, physical standards you're looking for or uh, something along that line. So whatever the variables are, you add a value to them. I mean, it's really that simple. So for us here, there are these categories, and I think our, our score system is out of 103 points. And it's really, um, you can decide that the application is worth 50 out of 103 points. The student essay is worth 20. Teacher recommendations are worth 5. Transcripts, 10. I mean, you, you just decide however you want to do it. Um, and, and then what's happened over the years for us is, of course, we keep changing it and redefining it and tweaking it based on how successful the kids are in our school. We then take that data and tweak our formula to make it even more refined to the type of students that we want. So again, here's the, here's the breakout. Um, the other key components that we have is the interview, character assessment, and you know, there's some MPS or Marianapolis MPREP specific content that we like to um, factor in as well. Legacy Faith Family, we're a Catholic school. Um, those, those sorts of variables may, may or may not factor into the overall um, score, um, depending on how it all breaks out. So here is the pinwheel of our particular percentages in each area. Okay, so the transcript is a big chunk of the students' 103 scores, 103 points, as is the interview. We factor in activities, recommendations, standardized test score, Marianapolis content, essay, and transcript again. So I will say that when I first started, we used to have the standardized test score was about 40% of this pie. I mean, it was a massive number, and it simply just did not indicate success in our community. And I'm going to pick on the standardized test score only because that's the most obvious. It's one that I think everyone's familiar with. And for us, in terms of success, it, it, just, it just wasn't there. The correlation was not there. Um, it was almost, you know, there, there was an argument one year where the kids that had the highest standardized test score, maybe they should actually lose points. Um, meaning it was a negative in our community. Some of the kids, they just weren't getting involved in our community. Um, they weren't integrating in the areas that we were hoping they would integrate. And so someone suggested that, you know, maybe we make it a negative. If you get over 98 in your, on your you know, SSATs, is that really good? Do we really value that in terms of our overall culture? And, you know, it's important, one of the themes that we look for in defining our culture is we want kids that will make other kids better. Um, so it's important. We want students that are going to enhance our culture and we want kids that have unique life experiences that we know they will benefit from our culture and our kids will benefit from their culture or, or their life experiences. And I think when you when you think in those terms, it's you realize that a standardized test score is um, you know, there's, that's why that score, I guess, is shrunk, just putting it in other words. So here we are. So, well, okay, so you take the standardized test score, and what I'm going to do now is I'm going to break this out into specifically how do we score these subcategories. So the standardized test score, and again, it used to, I used to have it be 95th percentile to 99 with something like, you know, well, let's just call 40 points out of, out of 100. 90 to 94 
was you know, 35 points, 85 to 89, and I was breaking it out in increments of five. Over the years, we've changed that. As you can see, this is radically different than the way we used to do it. And we now see, for us, kids that score in the 80th percentile and above, they get the maximum number of points from that category. If you score in the 45th to 79th percentile, you only lose three points. Okay? So for many of these kids, and this is an important distinction, we're not talking about who gets in and who doesn't. It's, it's really helping you define who's in the top 10% of your class based on what you value and who's in the bottom 10% of your applicant class. Okay? So you could have somebody, and believe me, these are the hardest kids for us to deal with as an admissions office, are those kids that come in with five points in the standardized test score. And those tend to be some of our best kids in so many other ways. And they may, even only scoring, even losing 13 points in this category, they may still be able to, to crack the threshold of getting into our school, but they're probably not going to crack the threshold of getting a scholarship at our school. And so it's one of those things where once you break out these subcategories, these are the talking points. Where did they lose the points? Where did your student lose the points? And you know, this is the first one, and I'm going to go through all these different subcategories. But you can see there's a big difference between 18 points and 5 points on a 100-point on a scale. But you, there's still a lot of time to recover. Still a lot of time to recover. Okay, so here, here it is. Um, so the transcript. Really quickly? We, we, sure. I'm sorry. Um, Catherine is asking, and these are two, I think one is, is very quick. She's asking if you have a scoring template for lower school applicants. Um, the short answer is, is no, but I think it's still, you know, you take, you take for example, on transcripts, um, and instead of transcript, I don't know what you would use to evaluate, maybe teacher comments, and somehow try and create a template that um, would work that's more applicable to lower school. But, but to answer the question, no, I don't have anything for, for lower school. Okay. I also have two other questions, and you may be uh, getting to these later on in the webinar. Um, one is, how do you account for and score potential red flags, whether it's social emotional issues, learning differences, etc.? Yeah, those are, those are always interesting ones. And, you know, it's simply, there are deal breakers. And there are some kids that, you know, we, we've had kids that have scored um, well based on our system, but because we know through the community, um, families and individuals, they're, you know, it's just, it's, they're the outlier and the system doesn't adhere to them. And so we're a small enough school where we have the luxury of really being able to override our own system at any time. And we don't often do that, but occasionally there are instances where, um, you know, kids will cross into the threshold of being acceptable, if you will, ba based on the point system, but we simply will not accept them um, for whatever reason. And so I think it, it comes with the, you know, for us it's the nature of a little bit of a smaller school that, that works to our advantage to protect the integrity of our culture. Okay. Um we also Other questions? Have, yeah, we have a question. Do you share, and this is about family communication, um, do you share a more vague explanation of the scoring system with families so they understand uh, what they're facing? I, I, you know, it's, it, that's a great question. And one of the things I love the most about this system is when I talk with parents and I, and I, and I explain the system and I just say, look, it's all about accumulating points. And believe me when I say I want every one of my kids to get as many points as possible in every possible category. So I, I am all about my families and I am all about my kids and helping them to get into Marianapolis. That's what I want for them. If they want to be here, I want to see them here. And so I, I enjoy sitting down and talking with parents and saying like, look, this is where Johnny is. This is why he didn't get in. And I, I need to put an asterisk aside. I don't enjoy telling kids they didn't get in, but I like being able to, to, to quantify it and frankly say, look, 
I want Johnny to reapply here next year. If he can pick up some extra air, if he can do a little bit better in his class work, get a couple of more higher grades, or get more involved in clubs and activities, um, those sorts of things, then it gives the student the incentive. You know, I, I explain the admissions process. It's it's a process. It's not, you know, because you don't get in one year, it doesn't mean that we don't think you can be successful here. And I always tell the kids to reapply, and I invite them back to my office, and I, I will explain to them without showing them teacher recommendations. Okay, so there are some limits that I will not cross. And generally, when I talk through it, I don't have to divulge any information I don't feel comfortable divulging to families. But once you explain this and you say, look, you know, he lost points because he didn't have straight A's for 7th and 8th grade, that's five points right there. Boom. And when you can go through anyone's sheet and see where they've lost point, points, it builds a really powerful message to the parent. And it tells them that, look, you're not, you, you, this is not just some you know, water cooler decision here. I mean, we, we sat down and we spent a considerable amount of time and you know, you're competing with the best of the best kids. And that's a message that all parents like to hear and I think it's a really powerful message to deliver to the community. Um, even if you're not, even if there's only one or two kids that you aren't accepting, to be able to sit down and tell those parents why you're not accepting their child and just saying like, look, there were a lot of other applicants that scored much higher, that just did better. It sends a, the right message to the community in terms of your own branding and your own positioning in your own local marketplace where you're, you're, you, you look strong and it presents a great appearance that you are looking for kids that, you know, straight A's, seventh and eighth grade. I mean, that, that's straight up what we're looking for. And I say to parents, you know, in the inquiry stage, in the prospect stage, I say, look, if Johnny or Susie has a C in seventh grade science, I mean, that could hurt them. That could hurt them. And, and there's no joke about it. It could hurt them because if, they if they're not getting straight A's or A's and B's, you know, they're down into perhaps a, uh, uh, you know, a 10 point range in a category here, the transcript category of 25 points. So if you're losing 15 points in this category, that's big. That's a huge deficit. That's a hard, that's hard to recover from, especially if you lost a few points on the, on the standardized test area. Um, so again, for us, this is how we score it, but I think every school is going to have their own system. And the first couple of years of doing this, you know, you gotta, you're going to end up tweaking it and redoing it, and you got to go back to see how the kids actually perform in your school and to see how do they actually do in order to really get these, um, these points and the system refined. And, and I say every year we change our system. Every year we're tweaking it and refining it to try and make sure we're getting the best possible kids. All right, are we ready to move on, Karen? Or? Um, actually, I have two more questions that, um, that are very, they kind of are, should be answered at, the, at this moment. Um, Whitney's asking, do you show this rubric, for lack of a better word, to parents or students as they start the process? No. It's all stealth. So I explain at most, I will tell them that we have a rubric and it includes all these different categories. I don't tell anyone what points we value. I tell them what categories, for example, but I will say, for example, you know, teacher recommendations are important. Your transcripts are important. And so early in the process, I'll, I'll be that general. You know, your essay is important, but it's essentially everything they're submitting into the application process anyway. On the back side of the process, so, so what ends up happening here, let's say we have 200 applicants, all right? I'm going to get ahead of myself for a minute, but I think this will help you to conceptualize what ends up happening. So you get 200 applicants. Your kids that are between 80 and 100, that score between 80 and 100 points, those kids are in. They are going to be the kids you talk about getting a scholarship. So we take our top 25 MPREP scores and we give 10 scholarships based out of those kids. Then you go down to the other end of the continuum, and it's where are you drawing the line as to who's not getting in, who's got the 50, you know, and there may be some 30s, 40s in there, so you may have five or six kids that score in the 30s and 40s. Okay, so that's pretty easy. There's not much of a case that anyone can have for those kids getting in, although there very well may, may be. Someone may want to fight the fight for one of their kids. I think it's a, it's a tough road to hoe if you're down that low, 
But if an admissions rep or someone feels passionate, then they have all the, you know, by all means, we'd love to hear the story. And we'll talk about it in the admissions committee meeting. But really, it's you define, let's say you're going to take 60 or 70 kids out of the 200 that, that have applied. Or let's say you're going to take 100, hoping to enroll 70. You know, then you have to, you know, where's the cutoff? And invariably, it comes down to a number, and let's just call it the number 75. Anyone above 75 is in. Anyone below 75 is out. But what ends up happening is you will have kids above 75 that you won't take, and you will have kids in the 60s that you will take. And that's kind of where your admissions committee meeting comes up, and that's where everyone's battling for their kids. But that ultimately helps you to really understand what are you looking for. And what makes this kid who has a 62 better than the kid who has a 78? And so it forces you to decide that, you know what? This is what we value, and we're going to go with this kid, and this is the reason why. Okay, great. I have a, a very specific question uh, regarding the SSAT scores. Um, this woman's asking, the ranking is based on the SSAT percentiles, not the national percentiles, correct? You can use either. You can use either. Whatever, whatever scoring, however you want to set it up. You know. Your SSAT percentile is going to give you a much finer point um, as far as, as the scores for your kids go. Um, the national percentile is based on a national estimate uh, rather than the bank of kids that take the SSAT. So you're going to get a much um, higher number for the national percentile. It's, it's more of kind of a feel-good number. Right. And so maybe you could do both and see if there's any difference in correlation in terms of success. Okay, I think the, um, the additional questions are, are more general that we can answer uh, later on if you'd like to proceed. Okay, all right, so we did, the, we did the standardized test and the transcripts, and so you can see the different point categories, and you can see how kids in the, in the standardized test category, it's 18 plus 25. So if somebody's got all their points here, 25 plus 18, you know, they're, they're scoring pretty high. Um, so they have some latitude to lose points in some of these other care categories. But for us, if you get a C, you're, you're going to need to have a lot, of, a lot of work ahead of you. Okay? And this is kind of how we broke it out in our, in our spreadsheet. And again, it's just what I just showed you um, in a different format. Teacher recommendations. So the way we do the teacher recs, all excellence and at least one top ten. Okay, the total they can get uh, per teacher recommendation is six points. Okay, so it's there's three teacher recommendations. If they get all excellent and at least one top ten, it's six. All excellence five. Majority excellence four. Majority goods three. Average majority below average zero points. We, we used to say all excellence, um, all goods. You know, it used to be if you had one average, you would get one point. Uh, but we softened this a little bit because there are some kids, and it was usually classroom participation that ends up hurting kids. And you know, if you get if you just get a regular classroom participation, you know, or average, I mean, that's that's really going to hurt you in this category, as you can imagine. And some schools, and this is where it's you're trying to objectify a subjective analysis. And there's no doubt that some schools are, are more generous and more lenient than other schools. And so we soften this category to try and be true, though, to understand what the teachers mean and to get their true, um, their true beliefs into our rubrics. Okay, so English, math, and additional. Now, one of the things for my additional teacher recommendation, if I really like a student, um, I will, and they get an additional recommendation where they don't pick up six points, I will call the student or the parent and I'll say, look, have them submit another additional rec. Have them submit a few more additional recs. So there are ways you can help your kids to get more points. So. The English teacher rec, maybe not so much. The math teacher rec, maybe not so much. But with the additional, you know, we accept you know, as many as they submit. And so to me, that's a category where every kid should be getting six points. And so if I believe in someone and I, really, and I worry about them being able to, to get over that threshold, 
then I will take the time to do that to try and help them. Um, this is the category where I don't really talk, I don't go over this with parents. Usually when I explain the uh, standardized tests and the transcript area, you know, they, they understand the complexities of your system and they don't drill down into, well, what did the teacher say? I, I've never been asked that. Um, I've had numerous conversations going over the rubrics with parents and with students that actually didn't get in. And it's all really positive, uplifting um, feedback that they take to heart and they, they work to improve on. Uh, any questions on the recommendations? Um, actually, Janice is asking, um, do you provide guidance to the writer of letter of recommendation or do you supply them with a questionnaire to complete? How does this work at your school given that letters of reference can vary so much? So I, I call it the check the box sweepstakes. So what I'm referring to these in all of these is we have a series of questions and they check either excellent, good, average, below average. I think actually it's top 10%, one of the columns. So there's a series of call it 10 or 15 questions from um, you know, class participation, um, respect for faculty, respect for peers, peer relations, academic efforts, achievements, all of those sorts of categories. And then each one, there's excellent, good, average, below average, top 10%. And then the, the teacher recs, we asked them to check one of the categories to define, to describe the student. So the English teacher rec, the math teacher rec, they all have similar questions. Um, and then those are the variables that we're looking for. When I say uh, six points, they've got to have all excellent. So every, all of those 15 questions have to be excellent in order for them to get six points. If they have a majority on the English teacher rec below average, the majority of, again, those 10 or 15 categories, they're going to get zero. And a zero is going to kill you, right? But no, no, nobody gets zeros. I mean, most of the kids will get at the lowest um, threes. A majority goods, I mean, even if you get a lot of averages, it's rarely a majority averages. Um, at least that's what we see here. Does that answer your question? Yes, that was perfect. Um, and you okay. give them this form to fill out, correct? Yes. So we give the we give the, the the students the application, and so we take it a step further now. Okay. So not only do we evaluate the English teacher rec, the math teacher rec, and the additional rec into itself. Okay. These are the categories: one, two, three, four, five. These five categories are the ones that we deem most, impro most important for us at, at Marianapolis. Emotional stability, personal integrity, maturity, response to criticism, and relationship to peers. Okay, so we used to look at, in the last slide, we looked at each rec individually. In this slide, we're looking at all three recs. So if the person, the student had emotional stability, had excellent in all three recs, they would get an extra point. Personal integrity, all three recs, extra point. Okay? If one rec did not give them a check in maturity, let's say one teacher, the math teacher, thought a student was immature, and everyone else thought he was excellent, he's not getting this extra point here. Okay, so they lose points. Um, and then the overall comments on the record, zero, one, or two. So if the teacher wrote some really nice comments, because we also have a category for teachers to write comments, the student can pick up an extra extra points here as well. Any any questions on, on this one? Uh, actually, these kind of uh, relate to your, your admissions process itself. Uh, Natalie's asking if your admissions process is online or paper-based or a mix of the two. Uh, um, we are hopefully going to be all online, but right now we are a mix of both, yes. Okay, and Margaret is asking if you accept a common application, and if yes, does this affect the rating of these students differently from those that fill out your specific application? Um, yes and yes. The common app does create a little bit of... You're cutting out uh, a little bit. Essentially. Yeah. Okay, you're back. We, okay, yeah, we've created a system where we have to um, adjust to that and tweak the system to to make it an overlay so that it works. 
um, we encourage our kids to um, to use this system um, and in order to be eligible for a Marianapolis scholarship you have to use our application so we use this you know this is critical for scholarship winners to equalize the playing field for all scholarship winners and then anyone who uses an other app um, a common app it's it's not as it's just not it's it's slightly different we have to tweak it because the we don't have the same variables. Okay, that's I think it for the specific questions at okay. this point. So extracurriculars. So one of the things we realized is that kids that play football or hockey or swimming or equestrian, we, we don't offer those. And those kids tended to um, want to do those sports and take away from our community. And so we decided to add MPS sports or MPREP sports that you can get up to nine points if you're doing sports that we offer. And community service, up to six points. Fine arts and music, up to six points. Hobbies and other sports, up to three points. So if you do play, if you're a world-class swimmer, you know, we don't want to penalize you for that too much. Um, and generally, we're, you're going to be picking up points in other categories, so this isn't necessarily going to be a, um, a deal breaker for you to get into Marianapolis or not, but it's certainly not going to help you to win the scholarship if you're doing some, a sport that we don't offer. Um, but you can see the max points allowed in the extracurriculars is 12 points. And so to me, in this category, you, everyone should be walking away with 12 points. If you can't pick up 12 points in this category, then that's a problem. And this is, you know, again, like the, like the common app or the additional recommendation, I should say. You know, this is an area where you've got to get your 12 points as a student. And, you know, there are plenty of points, plenty of ways to get there. And if a student loses points in this category, then that's, that's not a good sign. And generally, you know, it's not just this area. I mean, the kids tend to lose points across the board, um, is at least what we've seen. It's not just one category where they're, where they're going to come up short, especially as it relates to ex extracurriculars. Okay. So the essay. We rate the essay, very simple, three points. The interview, 10 points in this category. Pretty straightforward. And then some Marianapolis content some miscellaneous points. The family category, that's, you know, we interview mom and dad. Do they seem to understand um, our communication style? Do we feel as they're going to be the helicopter parent? Do we feel as though they're going to accept our mission and they're going to help us to educate their child um, or, or not? So the, those five points for family are, are are really, really important five points. I mean, that's one of the things that when we're looking at this, defining, you know, where, where do the kids lose points? Um, and that's really, that's the question we ask. So when, when this is all done, it's where did the kids lose points? And if you're losing points in some of these areas like family um, or student interview, I mean, those are really important points to uh, not to lose. Okay. And I had a handout which you all don't have, so I'm going to skip this. Um, but let's see if I, so what I did is there's a handout of some profiles and we scored some kids and based on the profiles, the students, um, uh, again, you don't have this information. This was actually for the SSATB, um, at the conference I, I did a handout, but, but I will, I will show you this. Um, so one student that we accepted lost most points on recommendations and activities but still got 85 points we accepted him we had a student who lost 
um, a waitlist candidate. And, well, you can read it. You can see we waitlisted and accepted kids in, in a wide range here. And student B was someone who was a, had, a, had a family tie to the school, which essentially trumped why we waitlisted them um, versus straight up um, denying them entry. Um, we put them on the wait list and, and had a very productive meeting, I thought, with the family about what they need to do you know, if they want to get in next year. Um, so that was kind of the, the systems in action. And then uh, someone asked earlier about the exceptions to the rule here as we're, we're winding down. Um, the high end prep score may be insignificant in conjunction with the low standardized test score. Yeah, so there are kids that will maybe get a lot of points but have a low M prep score. And those kids, sometimes we've had to say, we don't think it's the best fit. And so you have to know your system and where the weaknesses are in the system. I mean, there is an academic standard that our kids, frankly, have to be able to, you know, they have to have the aptitude. There's a threshold aptitude that, you know, you have to be able to cross. And if not, um, or if we worry about it, at the very least, we will have that conversation with mom and dad about our concerns and talk with them about um, how they want to proceed um, if it's a current family. And so generally we don't get families involved if a student can't get in based on aptitude or we're worried about their aptitude, we simply won't take them. Uh, but there was, a, there was a time a few years ago where there was the, the sibling of someone whose older brothers came through and he really wanted to come. And mom and dad were on board. They knew the challenges, and they wanted to support this boy. And we sat down, and we had the conversation, and, and they, they realized it was going to be an academic struggle. Um, and we gave him a chance, and he came, and he lasted a, about a semester. And it was a great experience all around in that he concluded he wanted to go to the public school. Um, he felt like he was really working hard to get just barely passing grades or not passing grades. And so he loved the school, had a lot of great friendships, a lot of great friends, but ultimately decided for his own good he was going to go to public school on an IEP where he can work, you know, a lot, where he can have a life and enjoy high school and have friends and do sports and not be so overwhelmed with school. So exceptions to the rule, it's important, and every, every you know, there always are um, exceptions to the rule. So for 42 points on this particular scale sheet are subjective. So recommendations, activities, essay, interview, family. Um, there's still a lot of objectivity as much as, or subjectivity as much as we try and objectify it. I still think overall it's a great process for our school and for us as an office, and it really makes, it makes file reading fun. I mean, we really look forward to looking at the kids on the bubble and deciding, you know, who gets the scholarship, how are top 25 kids, and which 10 out of the top 25 are, are we going to give the scholarships just based on their M prep scores. And we also know that um, we're not just pushing our kids. And so it's, you know, one of the things this year we're doing is we used to, each admissions rep would score their own files, but now we're moving to the front office. So our office manager is literally going to start scoring these um, as they come in. So as the English teacher rep comes in, they're going to get scored. And it's going to make our file reading. We're, we're of course, still going to have to do the family interview. And we're, of course, still going to have to do the student interview and score those from our interview notes. But the rest of it, we're moving out to the front office, which is going to be um, really helpful. And then the other thing we're doing is we're working to incorporate this into our database so that we can really start tweaking these numbers um, by, by subcategory and seeing how it trends out over years. Uh, in terms of comparing um, year after year kids in various different categories um, and then overlaying that with their academic success and, and other success in the school. And so there's a lot you can do with it um, once you get students into numbers, which is, which is exciting, it's fun, it's just I think it's that first push for you all that I hope this, this webinar will help you to um, have some fun with it and, and really the thoughtful part is determining what do you value and what do you want and how, how many points do you want to do it out of. You want to do it out of 1,000 or 200 or 50 or you know, figuring out the sort of logistics and scoring system you want to set up for your own office. Um, should be a, a fun assessment. And then as Karen, Karen mentioned, I did another 
I did a, a, a presentation, a webinar um, for for qualifying non-native speakers. So this, there are two things that I that I should uh, in, that I should talk about before I close. One, um, this whole assessment you really want to run by a lawyer or someone with some legal expertise, as I learned at SSATB. I think it would be wise to find out the legal implications of this sort of process. Um, if a family were to, you know, frankly, to be upset or to sue your school, I think you want to have some sort of legal understanding of, of how this all would work. Um, and then the, the other piece here is the, this is for our American boarders. So this whole system is for American boarding students. It's not used for international students. And since we're a boarding school, we have a number of kids that come in on the international side. And the other webinar I've done was about qualifying non-native speakers. So using the Skype interview to qualify and really drill down deep into understanding a student's um, English ability. Um, but it's, it's a very separate process, it's a very separate program, it's very different than, than the quantifying piece we use for American kids. Uh, but some of the highlights of that, you know, again, which is on this ACB um, website, you can see are, are listed there. And so I guess in closing, the last thing I would say is, is just that it's one of these things come, come March when you're doing your file reading and you've got 200 applications and you know you can take 70 kids and you push that pile of 70 apps in one side of the table and the 130 apps on the other side of the table and then you jump into the 70 apps because ultimately that's the core of your accepted class. And you decide, okay, where, where, which, which of these 70 kids can we maybe put on the fence? And then you put those 10 or 15 kids on the fence, and then you jump into the other 130 kids, and you're like, okay, we got 10 kids over here who we got maybe on the fence. Let's see which 10 kids we can pull from here and slide them over into the accepted side. And so it's, it's, really, it's really fun. Um, it's something in the office we really look forward to. And uh, it's not. It's it's helping to ensure that the best kids from all different angles, from all different aspects, uh, to stay true to the kinds of kids you want and need. And if you need a soccer goalie, or if you need a bassoon player, you know maybe some years that's going to help. And it's going to. But you'll be able to really see how much is it going to help. You know, are you taking a student who got a 46 but who's a great soccer goalie and bumping them into a 71 category? And then you have to decide, is that, is that really what you want to do? But, but I, it creates the conversation, it enables you to have the talking points, and it really helps to draw lines, I think, um, not only for your own office, but for your whole community at large, especially other administrators when they're trying to understand the complexities of, uh, of what we do in the admissions office. Okay, so I will say thank you all for your time. Um, if there are any other questions, uh, I'm, I'm available here. Actually, yes, we do have, uh, we do have a number of questions, Dan. So. Um, I'll read through the most uh, general of them. Um, please, everyone who's listening, uh, realize that I'm going to be sending a, uh, an attendee report from the webinar directly to Dan, um, so he may be able to um, ad address your questions specifically, uh, but I will get to as many as I can. Uh, Whitney's asking, if the goal of this process is to determine scholarship awards, how will this enhance the process of evaluating applicants in a school that only offers need-based aid? Well, it started off as being only for scholarship, but it really helps us define who, even on the need-based side, I mean, we use a lot of this. I mean, what's their MPREP score to decide who gets the aid and how much aid do they get? And so we're not a school that has enough aid for all of our kids, so we have to define who we want to give aid to. And frankly, if you're a student that has, you know, in the 90s uh, with an MPREP score, I mean, we, we want you here. And we're going to do everything we can um, versus a student with an MPREP score of, say, a 40. And so it started off really being about the scholarship, um, but it really has evolved to being more about helping us to define who are the best kids that are going to contribute the most to our culture. And so our goal is to get the best possible kids with the highest M prep score, because we know those kids with the highest number are the kids that do the best in our community. I mean, it's just that it's just it's that simple. 
Okay, Heather's asking, with your admission evaluation, do you feel that any kids get overlooked? Um, that's one thing that I would say no, and that's what I'm most proud about. I mean, we make sure nobody gets over, overlooked. We end up spending time um, with the kids at both ends of the continuum. So the kids that are your best kids, if anything, they're the ones that get overlooked. But we talk about them in the context of the scholarship. And then at the, at the back side, um, you know, we really spend time on those kids to make sure, or I should say the bubble kids. I mean, the back end side, the numbers kind of speak for themselves. Um, I mean, again, we're not, we're not, we're a small school, so I don't, I mean, we, I know all the kids in our school, I know all the applicants, and so we're not a school that's dealing with thousands of applications where kids just become numbers. That's absolutely not the case, um, but to a degree, we want them to become numbers. We don't want our personal feelings to um, interfere with what should be uh, a relatively objective decision. And so that's why we try and, and have this template to help us to make sure that I know I really like this student, but I have to not, I have to be true to you know, these guidelines. And the numbers help us to do that. And so I, I think we do a really good job, and I think the system helps us to really understand the strengths and weaknesses of all of our kids. So, yeah, no, I think it works the, uh, to our advantage and to the students' advantage for us to get to know them well. Okay. Um, Jim is asking in the activities section, do you care about proficiency in a particular sport or activity, and does the difference make or get an extra point anywhere? Yeah, you know, that, that Jim, is a great question. We've talked about that, and it's, it's a tough one. And so there is a, yeah, I think in that slide there's a reference to leadership in their sport. And it's one of those things where um, that category has changed so much over the years that it's essentially almost a give me. I mean, everyone should be getting 12 points. And so it could be one of those areas where if your student only didn't quite get um, all the points because they are such a superstar soccer player that all they do is soccer seven days a week and at the expense of many other things, then I think that is something that is going to come out. And you're going to, he may lose the points there or she may lose points there, but that's someone who is going to be high on the radar just simply because they stand out in that one area. Um, if they're across the board leader, you know, it makes it a little bit trickier. Um, but, you know, the short answer for, for to the question is uh, we're still trying to figure out a better way to do that category, I think. And so maybe, maybe you could take some time and put together a great formula that works to capture it all, and I'd love to see that. Um, Whitney is asking, do you have any suggestions to compare these results with current students to determine success in the upper school? So um, one of the things we always do as an office, we always take our five predictions as to who's going to do the best and the worst every year. Um, and what we've learned is we're always wrong. Um, so we, we, before we did this template, and it's a matter of, okay, who's going to be on honor roll, who's not, who's going to be academically struggling, who's going to be social, who's not. So we have these conversations. And I think in my school, you know, we're blessed that we're able to know the kids and kind of have these conversations and have fun with it. Um, but I think the, the, the place to start would be to try and gauge which kids uh, you think will do well this year. So the school year just started off is to, to, you know, to, take, to take an hour and look at the files that are up in your academic office and, and figure out who, who do you remember doesn't have really strong teacher recommendations. And who do you remember didn't do really well academically or didn't have a strong entrance standardized test score or entrance exam score. And try and gauge that to um, track their success. And then from there, you, you know, you could start building your, your, your rubrics um, just based on those, those variables. Uh, you know, the, the other thing I will add is you will see on the transcript, for example, we, we have you know, 30 different towns, if not more, and everyone does, teachers are, uh, score differently and some are really hard and some are, some are easy and, and locally speaking, we have a large local population. We know what schools um, and frankly, what teachers um, inflate and deflate grades. And so we don't have a formula that doesn't account in our formula, um, but we know. 
And so that's part of the discussion that we go back to what school is the person from. So when someone's on the fence, I mean, we're really digging down in deep into are they from a public school, a parochial school, an independent school, what school, what town? Um, because it comes down to we, want, we always want to take more kids than we can. And so there's always kids that aren't getting in that pains us as an admissions office. And so we really spend a lot of time um, trying to, to understand and account for the nuances that this, that this system just simply won't and can't. Um, to that end, Betsy is asking, how much are you considering non-cognitive assessment? Um, so, for example, what would be a non-cognitive non assessment? Uh, assessment of non-cognitive traits, non-standardized testing. So, um, like, what would be an example? Of um, if you're testing creativity, if you're testing grit, if you're testing that those types of things that are that are not measured by your typical standardized test. Right. So I think if you were to ask me, for me, this whole test is a grit test. So for me, this is what we determine as is MPREP grit. You know, this is these are this is the recipe, if you will, to help us to find the student that's going to make our community better. And meanwhile, they're going to benefit from our community because they're going to be better. And so I think this is our recipe to get the most out of every kid. And this is our recipe to help kids to take risks socially, academically, athletically, and not just be willing to take those risks, but to have a, a legitimate chance at success when taking these risks. So in standardized tests, I mean, that's straight up aptitude. That's, that's part of it. And so um, while we've minimized it over the years, I mean, it's still an important component of success in a, in a school. Um, it's less than 18% of the overall recipe is a student's aptitude. Um, but it is certainly 18%. You know, it's, it's a percentage that may or may not go up you know, with, with each passing year. But that's where we are right now. Okay, um, I think probably the remainder of the questions are very specific. Um, Samuel's asking, how did you decide the weights of the maximum points given? Yeah, Samuel, that's a good, I mean, it was, it was really something where it just evolved that way. Uh, I think we went on the 100-point scale simply because everybody, it's something that we know. We're all teachers or we're a teacher, at least in my office. So the 100-point scale seemed to be a good scale to operate from. Uh, and I think somehow we, we got up to 103. And again, it's, we kind of give the kids extra points because in our mind we're thinking out of 100, but it's really 103. So, um, But that's, there's, no, there's no real... Uh, quantitative formula to it for us, but it seems to be working. Okay, um, I want to thank our audience for tuning in, and a special thank you to Dan for providing our attendees with such a helpful presentation. Uh, just a reminder, I will send all registrants a link to the online webinar page where a recording of this presentation will be made available. Thanks again, and have a wonderful day. And, and if I can just say, say thank you as well, and anyone who wants to email me, feel free. I mean, I'm more than willing to, uh, to help you roll out a system or a process if, if you're interested. And I'll send, you, uh, I'll send Dan a copy of the attendee report, which will contain all the questions. So if we weren't able to reach yours, um, he can look that over and, and, and possibly you know, respond directly to you. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Karen. Thank you. Thank you, Dan.